Right. Following that, we're, we're moving away from hemp for food at the moment. We're going to go to uh, moving to hemp uh, as we bring our next presenter to join us here on stage. Um, this is uh, Dr. Maggie Davidson joining us here uh, from Western Sydney University. Um, at the completion of uh, Maggie's presentation, we're going to have a QA and a session here. So once again, if you've got questions uh, for Andrew Davidson, if you've got questions for Michael and you have questions for Maggie, please do fire them through via the Mentimeter and we're going to collate those and we'll pose them at the end. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Davidson is a lecturer and researcher in occupational hygiene and environmental health at the School of Science and Health in Western Sydney University. Um, Dr. Davidson has been a co-investigator for studies on worker health and well-being in the US and Australian dairy farms at the High Plains Intermountain Centre for Agricultural Health and Safety, as well as studies on worker exposure to inhalable biological aerosols, including bacteria, virus, fungi and endotoxin. Fabulous that she's here with us. A huge round of applause, ladies and gents. Dr. Maggie Davidson. What a, uh, what a, what a follow-up. Thank you so much for the introduction and I have to say my love to Richard Barge as well too um, for, the, for the opportunity to bring a, a, a subject matter that's dear to my heart and dear to all of our hearts and that is worker health and safety and while you don't want to put a value on a person's life, your, your workers are your biggest assets. Thank you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Those of, uh, those of you who know me well know that I'm a bit of a lab rat, so I like to hide in the back of the laboratory and coming out to speak. It's, uh, it's a challenge, and um, I thank you very much for your time today. So I, I'm actually an occupational hygienist, and uh, just a show of hands, has anyone heard of the field occupational hygiene out here? Oh, good, 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 good. We've got some people know. Usually when you say you're an occupational hygienist, there's this sort of look of confusion and they go, oh, uh, something to do with dentistry or do you clean something? Uh, well, we're actually the scientific branch of Oc Health and Safety. So we, we go into places and we measure how much of it's there, what's there, and try to uh, identify the potential risk associated with exposures. And this is everything from heat, noise, uh, thermal, right through to the area where I, I like to work in agricultural health and safety in the biological hazards. And see if I can find my pointer. Uh, here we go. So around the side, just down, down here. And there's, there's this branch in uh, agricultural medicine, agricultural health and safety. And it's growing and it's uh, really started out in Europe and the United States. And uh, we're, we're increasing here and here in um, New Zealand you actually have one of the leading experts for biological aerosols, Dows, and I've been following him since my early days and he's uh, right here at your local university, Matthew. So one of the things that we, I noticed uh, working in Colorado is there's a missing piece to the puzzle as we start to talk about uh, the growth in the cannabis market and that is health and safety. It seems to often get left out of the conversation and I just wanted to bring this piece of the puzzle back in because agriculture is actually, as I'm sure all of you here in the, in the room, is one of the most dangerous industries to work in. Uh, here, here in New Zealand, the statistics in uh, comparison to the next highest for workplace fatalities is actually quite a big difference, as you can see. Uh, 124 deaths in the last six years as opposed to 35 in the construction industry. Plant operators, and I watched with uh, interest about the uh, cleaning out of your uh, combine harvesters <laughs> with the, the <laughs> uh, and bated breath and going, oh no, oh no, um, because plant, plant machinery and operation is actually one of the most dangerous aspects and that's something obviously that we need to focus on given the nature of the product and the potential for these blockages. So this is some, an area that we need to be very aware of. Um, and also in agriculture is that 
usually with most workplaces, when you leave at the end of the day, there's a, a discrete separation and you have this break. So your body actually has time to recharge and recover. But when we're starting to talk agriculture, then we have people living on farms. So there's this constant 24 hour exposure. And also we have uh, vulnerable and at risk worker populations. We have children on farm, we've got women. We've got older farmers. I was having a really interesting discussion last night with a lady. And what do we do when, uh, when our with the ageing population on farms in the succession. And as we get older, we also do get more vulnerable to certain illnesses and conditions. So we have a, a suite of standard, I had to word standard, but it comes up, uh, agricultural health and safety hazards on the farms, as you can see here. But when we introduce the hemp, we introduce another level of biological hazard into the conversation. And as Hollister famous, he wasn't referring to health and safety at the time, but uh, he was talking about the complexity of the oils and, and the um, compounds within the hemp plant, but it also comes to health and safety too in that when we introduce a biological hazard, we actually introduce uh, a whole suite of uh, different illnesses and different ways in which our bodies react. So the area which I'm talking on today is more in to do with the respiratory diseases, uh, skin diseases and allergic diseases. We've actually known for hundreds of years about uh, the uh, lung disease and respiratory diseases associated with hemp production. Uh, Ramzini, who we refer to as the godfather of occupational hygiene, uh, commented on this back in his treatise on uh, morbidity and mortality in occupations. And he was talking about the fowl and uh, uh, mainly he seems very uh, adverse to the retting. That was his, <laughs> the noxious odours coming from the retting process where we use the microbes to actually break down the, the fibres to make it accessible. Uh, again, once we introduce microbes into the mix, we're introducing uh, pro-inflammatory agents potential for infectious diseases. Um, so it's, it's nothing new and respiratory diseases are still a major issue in the health and well-being in our rural populations. They're a bit more insidious in that when we talk about the combine harvesters, it's very obvious when you've had an accident and injury, you're, you've degloved your arm or you're missing a limb. But with the occupational um, respiratory diseases, they build over time and eventually getting to the stage where you can't breathe. And we, uh, I did a lot of work with dairy farmers and the lung function capacity uh, is much lower in people long-term working in um, dairy parlours. So, so when we start to talk about these organic dusts, as opposed to say a herbicide or a pesticide exposure where we've got one chemical and we can work out where it's going to go in the body where it compartmentalises and the exposures, when we talk about biological dust, they're a very complex mixture, both in, in, actually do have inorganic compounds, so you can have uh, mic microbes, you can have pollens, you can have plant fibres, animal danders, insect danders. These are some electron micrographs um, that we've taken from samples actually collected in the cannabis botany lab. And this is the inflorescence. So you see these little hairs that break off. And that's a picture of a, a mite or some kind of insect that's got caught up. And these are all the particles that are in a range that can actually get into your lungs. Once they're in the lungs, they can have all kinds of, uh, they can cause direct sensitization, they can cause irritant effects, and they can also simulate your active and your innate immune system. So by active and innate, we mean active is when you have a pathogen that's presented directly and your body actively recognizes it and stimulates that hypersensitivity response. And the innate is our long-term uh, uh, response. And so this responds rather than to specific things like pollens and the active, it actually responds to plant structures such as the endotoxin, which is part of the bacterial cell wall, uh, three hydroxy fatty acids. And then that stimulates a cascade response in your, in your uh, body. So when we come to hemp, uh, a lot of the research 
was done in the, uh, between late last century and there is a high incidence of bisonosis, which is Monday morning fever in the population. <laughs> I can see a few nodding out there. Uh, and this was studied uh, predominantly in the textile mills. Uh, we don't know the actual etiological agent of bisonosis per se, we're still trying to figure it out it, because it's suspected to be a um, innate immune response. Uh, it could be tied up with the endotoxins, we don't know. But that's just one element. So we also have um, bronchitis, uh, we have potential for those massive uh, exposures, one off, say if you get a contamination of a batch which will uh, uh, hypersensitivity response, um, sorry come back, I got ahead of myself, I'll come back. <laughs> so this is the two pathways. So we have the adaptive, where you've got the presentation, and when we talk about hypersensitivity, uh, uh, pneumonitis, uh, I'm talking about the allergic alveolitis there. So uh, say aspergillus, the farmer's lung disease, and that's a known pathogen which uh, can occur, and that's one of those really important things also, keeping the heat down in your silos. You, microbes are bad for spoilage, but they're also bad for your lung health as well. Just, oops, I'm running out of time already. And I've got ahead of myself, so the bisonosis Monday morning. So this is where the worker comes in and you've had a break, and then they start to feel uh, shortness of breath or fever symptoms, and it generally goes away during the week, only to return after there's been a break in exposure. But if it, it gets progressively worse until it's, it's pretty much constant. These are some of the other respiratory diseases that have been historically tracked in association with hemp production, mainly in the textiles. As we move into new products, then we also create new hazards and new uh, potential exposure pathways. We also have naive populations where people might not have been exposed and, uh, to previously and maybe also more susceptible. Uh, we also see this, uh, say, one area I was looking at with, uh, was the construction industry. I noticed that there was an absence of PPE. And when they start to mix the hemp uh, the hemp material with the binders, then there's also potential for exposure to things like uh, crystalline silica can make its way into that mix. You've got the Portland cement. And when you see people pounding that and generating an aerosol with no protection, it is a little alarming. <laughs> So uh, the Health and Safety at Work Act is the OCH Health and Safety Act over here for New Zealand. In Australia, it's the, uh, we've gone the other way, Work Health and Safety Act, uh, WHS. So when we come to managing the risk of exposures within the environment, it's everybody's responsibility. Everybody plays a part for protecting each other and making sure that we all come home safely and that we all live a long life. Uh, the real test with your system is, un is knowing that everybody's aware of the part they play and how they can help uh, provide a safe and healthy working environment. You have some wonderful resources here at the WorkSafe program. I was tooling around on their website having a look and they even have a contact number. If you want to get someone out to visit your property to provide advice, they, they have a contact up there for you. When we're talking risk management, we work along the hierarchy of control. So we can make health and safety very, very complex, or we can make it simple. Uh, when you come to a potential hazard within your workplace, you can apply this level of thinking. The, st the strongest um, and most effective controls are where we eliminate. The weakest is where it's at the receiver, uh, which is the personal protective equipment. The so. Obviously, we can't eliminate hemp product because that's what we're trying to grow, and I love, the, I love it, and I'm a big supporter of it, so I don't want to see that eliminated either. Substitution might be where you might have uh, a low allergen, uh, one's got a lower allergen uh, trigger, and then as we go lower, we have engineering, administrative and, administrative and personal protective, which is what I'm going to focus on for the next a uh, little bit, because that's where we can really bring in the controls. So engineering controls, 
Keeping that dust suppressed uh, can mean things like extraction systems, or it can also mean ensuring that you have HEPA filters in your cabs, that you've got that, uh, that way of removing the dust and, and pollens from the environment. And the other engineering controls, especially when we're coming in and we're talking about the accidents with the, again, coming back to the, the um, combine harvesters, protecting active barriers to stop people from putting their arms into places where they never should have gone. And I know it may seem like common sense to a lot of you, but when we got new workers coming onto farms or people are not used to the environment, they might not have this inbuilt safety system or this way of thinking that becomes natural to those who've been raised in uh, generations on the farm. And we actually have to train them out of these instinctual habits. Don't put your arm... I and mean, even those who work a long time on farms, it can still happen. This is a case where... Uh, on a potato farm where the guy fell into uh, the combine and he unfortunately died. But he'd been working for 30 years. Uh, the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes. We can get into a hurry and we can get into a rush. Stop. Your life is worth more than that five minutes you'll save by quickly going in there to pull something out of that, that locked area. Administrative controls is another very important part. This is where you bring in your training and uh, say they were talking about the silos again, keeping that heat down, making sure they're not loaded uh, 24 hours. Silo fillers disease where you get nitrogen dioxide uh, when you get too much heat. That's a strong irritant in your lungs as well. Uh, you can get uh, Poor, poor uh, maintenance programs in the silos can also lead to as, asphyxia in environments. Uh, and unfortunately, we do get cases out in Australia where uh, the oxygen's down, depleted and you get one person go in and they'll pass out. Someone will go in to rescue them. They'll pass out and you get this chain. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, also, lockout, tag out. Uh, you're working in the top of the tractor, <laughs> someone's underneath it. Pull the keys out. Uh, the, there is very sophisticated lockout, tag out systems. This ensures that no one can switch on machinery while you're in there working on it. Uh, but the simplest, pull the key out, the key's in your pocket, no one else can turn that instrument back on. Uh, cleaning schedules, again, the dusts, uh, we, want to, we want to reduce the exposure to the dusts. Uh, this is what happens when you use high pressure um, compressed air onto it. It generates these really fine aerosols and they can suspend for a long time. Uh, it was interesting again yesterday to hear about the leaf blower. Uh, nice idea, I understand. The immediate risk is definitely to reduce that fire and explosion. But um, yeah, maybe you want to have a think about a respirator if you're going to be doing that repeatedly for yourself, just to protect your own health. And vacuuming as opposed to sweeping. Just simple processes, but these can significantly reduce your exposure. And again, this is a, another case here in New Zealand where it was a lockout, tagout case where it wasn't shut down properly. So the, these may sound very simple in essence, but they save lives and people do die in these ways. Personal protective, the last line of defence, really only as good as the user itself. And we can also really overload people with too much. Um, Highly mobile areas, sometimes where you're shoveling or going in places, yes, but it's, it's really the last answer. I mean, you can imagine being out in the middle of the field, really, to, 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 to spray. That's going to be very uncomfortable and put the person at risk of heat stress as well. If you're overprotected with your hearing protection and you have to actually remove the, the, um, the hearing protection to hear the person next to you, uh, then you're actually exposing yourself to noise. So yes, we can go, don't reach for the highest grade of earmuffs. They might not necessarily be appropriate for your situation. But then in other areas, it's, it can be good. Uh, having, say, overalls that you keep on site can also reduce the bringing back of pollens and dusts into the home environment too. So you can have a set of kit that you leave at the, uh, at the office, at the, <laughs> at, the, um, at the farm gate as you head into your own home areas. Um, and 
also you want to think about too in reducing your, your exposure and worker exposure to hazards is health surveillance. Uh, people, lung function testing um, is one, one of the tools in the kit uh, to check that people's lung function is not declining over time. Emergency planning, uh, one of the things with hemp is it's highly uh, allergenic. So, and even the seed dust is associated, we've had some cases of uh, respiratory failure, people being exposed to the seed dust, anaphylactic shock. Uh, so if you have people who uh, already have seasonal allergies, they may be sus more susceptible and you might want to consider keeping an EpiPen uh, on site or ensuring that they check with their GP before they start work and carry their medication. Incident reporting is very important. Uh, yesterday's near miss could be tomorrow's fatality. So keeping track of where those are happening and program maintenance planning. It sounds, sounds so simple and straightforward, but these are all elements that can help keep yourself and your workers safe. At the moment, we don't have best practice guidelines in Australia. Uh, something I'd like to see developed is similar to the Colorado's. They've developed a guideline for the marijuana industry. Um, and this is an area that I'm working in at the moment, which is uh, exposure assessments. At the moment, we have two exposure assessment readings. You can use cotton dust or you can use inhalable particles. And as you can see, there's an order of magnitude difference. So what's really protective for your workers? And then there's the other element in that exposure standards are developed for a healthy worker exposed 40 hours a week, five days a week over a working lifetime. Uh, when we're talking farming, we're talking much longer exposure periods and even 24-hour exposure periods. So are these really protective? And then we also, that's a healthy worker. Uh, what about people who have never been exposed, naive workers, and also uh, those who are older or younger? So these, these are some of the resources that I've found online and I'd encourage you to have a look at the, the WorkSafe website if, they, if you have questions or queries or come and talk to me. I, um, I'd be more than happy to help if I can. They, they've really been working in the farming area and we are seeing a reduction in fatalities, accident and injury rates and it's, it's all of our work together. Your, your staff and your family, they're so important and that's, you know, it's, it's a job's not worth a life. It's keeping everyone healthy and safe. So where we're going at the moment is we're actually beginning to characterise some of the exposures in these new and emerging industries. We've been actively seeking out to see just what people are breathing in, in hemp, um, hemp mills and places. And this, this is the work I'm working on, is looking at the dust and trying to figure out just what pathways are actually being activated. So in summary, I'd just like to say it is a high risk uh, occupation and it's all of our work to help each other. Um, the biological hazards we do know to an extent uh, that they do cause respiratory disease and allergies, uh, but we're not completely sure about all those pathways. So just keep those dust levels as low as reasonably possible and don't stick your arm in it. <laughs> um, and but yeah. Like this, thank you for your time, and again, thank you, a big thank you to Richard for the invite. Much appreciated. Thank you.